States Senator Ed Kennedy, and this uh, I'd like to welcome you to the second edition of the Beacon Hill Buzz. And with me today is Anita Walker, the Executive Director for the Mass Cultural Council. You're welcome. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Could you start off by telling us a little <laughs> bit about your background? I know that you are from California and that you went to school in Arizona, and that for a while you were the, um, you ended up running the Department of uh, Cultural Affairs in Iowa, and now you're in Massachusetts, so. I'm on my eastward migration, but I have to stop because I'm now kind of at the edge, right. and I'm gonna get wet if I keep moving east. I have a funny kind of a serendipitous career. My very first job was as a weather girl back in the 1970s. That, that was the name of the job, weather girl. I knew nothing about the weather. They hadn't invented meteorology then. Basically, I just looked out the window and says, sunny, it's right. raining, whatever it was doing. Um, but from there, I went into journalism. I became a television newscaster and reporter. And then um, I got a job working in economic development. And I worked at a state economic development agency in Iowa for about nine years. And then I worked in cultural nonprofits raising money and after that, uh, Governor Tom Vilsack, uh, who was governor of Iowa at the time, appointed me to run his Department of Cultural Affairs. So it took sort of my communication skills, economic development, and as we know, the cultural sector is a big economic driver, and fundraising, which you know I spent a little bit of time doing on Beacon Hill, all came together um, to uh, kind of make me in a good position to do this kind of work. Okay, and you've been in Massachusetts since? Uh, 2007? Exactly 12 years ago, <laughs> Wednesday, I started. Um, and what have been uh, the main areas of, that you were focused on, um, and what are your responsibilities at the Mass Cultural Council? Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the agency. A lot of people don't even realize we're a state agency. So it, it is public tax dollars that fund the Mass Cultural Council, and we do work in a lot of areas. Among the things we do, we fund 400 cultural nonprofits in the arts, humanities, and sciences, including many right here in Lowell, uh, like the Quilt Museum and Mary Mac Rep. Um, we also fund 329 local cultural councils that cover every square inch of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. These are sort of our grassroots, the fabric of the work, all volunteer run, appointed by their cities and town, and do their own grant making. So these are the people that really can look out their window and walk down Main Street and really feel the needs of their communities. Um, we have 46 state designated cultural districts in Massachusetts that we support, including one of our very earliest ones right here in Lowell, which has really been an exemplar around thinking about the ways that the arts and culture are part and parcel of making Lowell a great place to live and, and visit. Um, spurs economic prosperity, part of the third largest industry, cultural tourism, but also it's good in terms of young people preparing the next generation for our creative economy. When young people have an art, opportunity to participate in the arts in school and in their community they get a better education. Um, and our creative youth development programs which are really about unleashing the agency and potential of young people, um, particularly adolescents. Um, we fund those programs here in Lowell as well. Okay. What would be some of the challenges that you face going forward or, or that the uh, Mass Cultural Council faces going forward? Well, I think uh, the first thing is we're interested in how we increase accessibility and vibrancy in the cultural sector in Massachusetts. Um, you know, our nonprofit cultural organizations have a kind of interesting business model. They create a product and then sell it for less than a cost to make. There are very few business people who would think that is an idea for a viable, right. ongoing concern. Uh, but that's really what the nonprofit sector is all about. So we work very, very closely uh, with our organizations to think about how they can adapt to the changing environment, the changing funding priorities of private funders, and how to really do a good job of case making around why an investment in these organizations um, is a good investment. Yes, we make grants but we also provide an enormous amount of technical assistance and consultation. So we're really interested in the health and sustainability of our organizations that are really the backbone of the work. But we're also interested in how we can increase our partnerships with elected leaders in cities and towns so that we're really working together around the table at City Hall or Town Hall in shaping our communities to be great places to live and visit. Our cultural sector isn't just about creating entertainment over here to be doing in an evening, 
evening or on a Saturday, but we're really part and parcel of the life of our community. It's really a dynamic sector and it has a lot to bring to the table, so we're working really hard on that. And then finally, when I talk about accessibility, we know there are a lot of people who would really love and benefit from participation in the arts, but don't think they can. They don't think they can afford it, or maybe they've never been to the theater or the, to a concert and they feel intimidated, you know, what, what would it be like to walk into a show at Mary Macarep if I've never been there before? So we're very excited about a new partnership that we launched last year with the Division of Transitional Assistance, another state agency. This is the agency that issues the EBT card, or some people would think of it as the food stamps card. It goes to people at about 150 percent of the poverty level. And we made a deal. We said, I'll tell you what. <coughs> we will recruit organizations in Massachusetts to accept the EBT card as free or drastically reduced admission if you, other state agency, will tell everybody with the EBT card about this opportunity. Well, just since last July, we've recruited 180 organizations in Massachusetts to accept the EBT card, and since then, more than a quarter of a million people with the EBT card have taken advantage of it. So I would say if we have viewers who have the EBT cards, uh, go to our website and take a look and see if there's an organization near you so you can be an arts participant. It's, that's pretty incredible. Um, and it's something good for people to know, I think. And, and most people don't know that. Um, during your time, during your tenure with the uh, uh, Mass Cultural Council, are there any projects that um, that you you can recall that would be your favorites, or have been that have been special? Oh, I don't know. They're all my favorites, yeah. I think, and they're all special. But I think um, sort of one of the thematic areas, one of the things that's been the biggest change in the Mass Cultural Council in the last 12 years since I've been there, 12 years ago, the agency really was more of a grant maker. It was an agency where we had people in Boston whose main jobs was taking in applications, assembling panels to review the applications, and then sending out grants to individuals or organizations or local cultural councils. We are a much more hands-on service organ oriented organization now. So for example, I have a staff member, Michael Ibrahim, who's an expert at fundraising. He teaches fundraising at BU. There's probably not a person watching who either likes fundraising or feels really good about knowing how to do it to get the best results. We send Michael out to every corner of the Commonwealth. He will sit at the kitchen table with a volunteer who's trying to raise money for her local cor chorus or community theater or youth program and sit and work together until they have a good fundraising plan in front of them. We have organizations that are really struggling on the precipice of how they're going to even make payroll at the end of the week. We'll send our staff out there and sit with them and think about their business model and some changes that they can make so they can be sustainable and still be able to serve their communities. So it's really, I think, we've transitioned to being more of a service consultancy organization where every grant is really wrapped in a program and it's the combination of a little bit of an investment and then the knowledge and expertise to put it to work, which is really what our focus is today. Okay. And, you know, we're coming into the summer months, and usually people are looking around for uh, things to do on the weekend. And although there's a lot to do in Lowell <laughs> and the surrounding area, uh, what would be some of the other, um, some of your favorite sites or sites that you might recommend to the viewers that they might consider for the summer? Well, I think everyone should just come to Lowell because there's so much going on in Lowell. I think it's a pretty simple answer. But we were having a conversation earlier today about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, and that's the topic of festivals. So about, I want to say maybe three or four years ago, we became the first state in the country to launch a program to support festivals. And there's really two reasons. There's the reason we love festivals and we want to help um, communities all over Massachusetts uh, be able to hold festivals and that costs money and so we do make a grant to them. But we actually had a little different hidden agenda around our support of festivals and wanting to see them proliferate in Massachusetts. And that is because the festival has the lowest barrier to entry for participation in the arts. You know, you could have no interest in the arts, be completely disinclined to take yourself to an arts event, but one after you, you go down to Main Street or you go into a park and you've stumbled into a festival and the next thing you know, time flies and you've had the best time in your life and you've really had an opportunity to have an arts experience. So festivals are extremely accessible, generally they're free. Mm -hmm. They're also great community builders because 
people organize them in communities. They come together, they form a team, they form a committee, they think together, and they make something wonderful in their community. They're great marketing and branding for a community. I mean, if people don't know Lowell, they know the Lowell Folk Life Festival. I mean, a festival can put a community on the map and attract visitors here from all over. Right. So there are so many benefits to festivals um, that we're pretty excited about finding ways to help communities not only have a successful festival, but how we can sort of capture uh, that marketplace, those people who've come to participate in festivals and bring them back time and time again to our communities. Okay. It, here in Lowell, we also, I think we have a, a good appreciation for the value of, um, of arts and culture um, and festivals and tourism. Uh, we have a national park here. Um, but how would you convince legislators or people in other communities that maybe don't share that appreciation that um, arts, culture, and tourism is a, is a great economic uh, driver? Well, you know, I do have one thing I do with legislators from time to time. I have to say, by and large, our legislators are pretty uh, well versed on the benefits and the impact of arts and culture in communities. At least they are if they ever go to their communities and experience it. But one thing I'm fond of saying to a legislator is, how about this, I'll make you a deal. You give me a dollar and I'll give you seven dollars. Does that sound like a deal? Mm -hmm. Most people would take me up on that deal. Well, that's the deal that the Commonwealth has with the cultural sector. For every dollar the legislature invests in the Mass Cultural Council, we put seven dollars right back into the general fund. We realize that there are many, many uh, challenges and opportunities facing the Commonwealth, whether it's investments in education or transportation or air quality or uh, alleviating poverty. And the Commonwealth needs funds in order to be able to do that. Well, just by giving us one dollar and we give you seven back, that's more resources that the legislature can use to address um, the other challenges that are facing the Commonwealth. So we think we're a pretty good return on investment. And you know what else? We just make it a lot more fun and joyous to live in Massachusetts. Yes, that's absolutely correct. <laughs> One other thing I do like to think about, um, we have an enormous responsibility in Massachusetts that I don't think a lot of people spend time thinking about. Um, this state, this Commonwealth, is the steward of some of our nation's most important historic and cultural assets. When people think about democracy today, and where was democracy born? It was born right here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. People come from all over the world to go to the Old North Church and to visit our historic sites and to put their feet down where George Washington walked and think about what it took to create a democracy in America. It's our job to take care of that, and that costs money. So we have the Cultural Facilities Fund that as of today has invested $110 million in preserving and taking care of these historic assets, not just for us in Massachusetts, but really for the whole world that wants to know where did democracy get started and how did we do it. As you look forward, um, are there any special projects that you would like to see in the Commonwealth or are there, are there ideas that are, or things that other states do that you would like to bring in to Massachusetts? With all humility, I will say most of the states are copying Massachusetts. Okay. Just on the way to this meeting, I got an email from somebody in San Francisco who wants to know how to, know how to do the EBT Card to Culture program out there. Okay. New Jersey has copied us on the EBT Card to Culture program. But thank you for asking that question, because I haven't really talked much about this lately. Um, this is something that we've been sort of having in the R&D, Research and Development, the Mass Cultural Council, but it's an area where I think, once again, Massachusetts could be a leader. Massachusetts was a leader in the creative economy. Massachusetts has been a leader in our investment in creative youth development, in the development of our cultural districts. And I think the next frontier in this country is to think about the impact participation in the arts has on people's health and well-being. Now, other countries are ahead of us, but we'll catch up and get ahead of them pretty quick. Mm -hmm. But let me give you one example. England, this year, at the beginning of in January, the head of public health for England announced, we're spending too much money prescribing pills and over-medicating people. We need to think of an alternative. It's expensive and it isn't effective. And we now have an opioid epidemic like is all right. over the world. He authorized for the first time in England something called social prescribing. 
And what that means, if somebody comes to the doctor and they're lonely or they're depressed, the doctor might write a prescription to go to the theater, to go take an art class. The number one most expensive health problem facing senior citizens over 75 is falling down. In England, they prescribe ballet. Strengthens your balance and strengthens your ability to um, support yourself. So we're now looking into what can we start doing here in Massachusetts to connect arts participation, of which we have huge amounts of arts resources in Massachusetts, with the idea that it's actually good for you. It's not only fun, it not only is community building, it's not only an economic driver, but it gets people to be healthy. You know, because I think you probably told me, 40% of the state budget goes to health care. <coughs> what if we could just take a tiny bit of it, 1% or 2%, and alleviate that because of, instead of expensive medication, we were prescribing the arts. Right. So that's, that's on the horizon. That's kind of the new world, the brave new world we're thinking and looking about. But we've got some um, uh, partners out there that are interested in exploring it with us. So stay tuned. I might have to come back on another program and talk okay. more. All right. And, um, what, in, in just talking to the viewers now, what can you, uh, what would you say to the public, uh, what can they do to advocate um, for your mission and the work that the Mass Cultural Council does? That's a, such a great question because um, what we're able to do at the Mass Cultural Council is only possible because we have support from the legislature. We're a state agency and we are state funded. We don't, we're not able to provide nearly as much financial support as everybody would like to have. It's very competitive. But even a small amount has huge leverage effect. In other words, when an organization has funding from the Mass Cultural Council, they're able to go out to say to other individuals and friends in the community, look, you know, the Mass Cultural Council believes in me. Will you believe me in me too and give us a little funding and support? So what I would say, number one, is participate. It's good for you. I would say do that for yourself. You know, go to a show, go to a play, go to a festival. It doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. Um, you can go to free things. A lot of our organizations have events that are absolutely free to the public. Just try it once if you've never done it, just go and participate. And then secondly, think about this fact. Um, if you buy a ticket to a theater performance, you've actually only paid for one third of the cost of that experience. So think about other ways that you can support an organization and help them be able to continue to serve the community. Volunteer. Uh, you could be an usher. You could, you know, be a ticket taker. Think of a way you can volunteer. You could help organize your community festival. Um, and maybe write a check. I think a lot of our organizations and our uh, communities would really appreciate that. But this is the easiest thing you can do that won't cost you a nickel, and that is write or call your elected leaders your state senator, your state rep, and your local elected leaders. People right. on the city council at the mayor's office and say, you know what, it means a lot to me. I like living here because there's a cultural environment that I can participate. It's good for my kids. I like to raise my kids in a place where there's vibrancy and creativity because I know they're going to have to be creative when they grow up to be successful. And maybe I'm a senior citizen and you know, I don't have a lot to do all day long, but it's the cultural environment in my community that gets me up in the morning and gets me out of the house. It gets me with people, which is so important to have an opportunity to be with people and, and, and to be social. So these are all things that are really important to communicate to your elected leaders um, so that they can continue to have the kind of confidence we've seen already in their ability to support the work. Okay, thank you. I want to thank you, Anita, for, for coming on today. Um, and also, I know you participated in a roundtable earlier today at Middlesex Community College, so you spent a good amount of time in, uh, in Lowell. And I think that Massachusetts, the Commonwealth, is very lucky to have you as the Executive Director of the Mass Cultural Council. So once again, thank you very much. I just want to add, if there's still time, we are fortunate to have you as our champion on Beacon, Beacon Hill. And if the viewers don't know it, you are the chair of our Committee on Tourism, Arts, and Cultural Development, which means that Senator Kennedy really uh, is at the vanguard of uh, advocating for the arts and culture here in Massachusetts. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>
again, this is State Senator Ed Kennedy, and I just wanted to thank you for watching the second segment of Beacon Hill Buzz. Uh, we're going to try to do this show uh, once a month, um, and we'll see how that goes. But um, thank you very much, and enjoy your day.